we have many police officers that are not from the communities they serve. Right. They don't understand the dynamics of the communities they serve. So it, it just leads into that us versus them mentality. We have to have empathy training. We have to have restorative justice training. And we have to have police officers that are engaged in the community, that are stakeholders. Because I truly believe unless you're a stakeholder in your community, you're not really going to be invested in that community improving. Right. So that's extremely important. So again, we could throw all the money out there in the world that we want. We could have RoboCop walking around there. But until we have police officers on a systemic level that are invested from the time our, our, our children, our youth, you know, toddlers, until they become adults, knowing people's names, stopping in the businesses, saying hi, yes. shaking people's hands. You know, I did some investigations, and I think this occurred in Las Vegas. There was a sheriff out there that actually had a policy where it was a quota for his officers to meet people. They had to at least shake 10 or 12 hands per day nice. and build relationships with community members. That was policy. I think that's important because I see the difference when our officers have relationships with our youth and with our families. Uh, and we don't have that right now. I was just in St. Louis. We have a colleague, another candidate, Corey Bush. I'm extremely close with her. We were peacefully protesting. The police pepper sprayed, tased, and antagonized peaceful protesters. Immediately got out their riot gear and were aggressive. We have to change that. We have to demilitar demilitarize our police forces and focus on relationship building. Because I guarantee you, you can stop so much more with a smile than you can with a gun. Right. I truly believe right. that. Right. So that's extremely important with our criminal justice reform. Now, I mean, we could talk about this all night. I have so many family members that have been incarcerated. My brother was incarcerated. And I see how, though they tried to sell this bill, this, uh, bill of goods where they state they focused on rehabilitation, they're no. not. No. They're focused on profit. And that's why recidivism pays. They want individuals to come back, to be honest. Right. Because, again, the privatization of our prison systems, free labor that occurs uh, when we have our prisoners out there working for pennies or working for free, it's about profit. And we have to move away from that and make it about people and truly focus on rehabilitation and restorative justice practices where we empower victims, where we empower those that have been harmed that lack ownership, and also show offenders what they have done and how can they make amends. It's important. Right. We want them to be a part of society. We don't, right. you know, I mean, right. we want them to be a part of society. The prison for profit system just wants to keep them in their workforce. Definitely. It benefits right. to keep them in there. It definitely does. Or, you know, perhaps to have high recidivism rates where they return quickly. Because you can't, you cannot tell me that you release somebody from prison. They have minimal support. Right. And oftentimes, politicians including the incumbent yes they fight for certain policies but again the policies that the policies they're fighting for are treating symptoms on the back end they right. wait till you're released from prison and fight for policies that may help you and may support you on the back end how about we support on the front end treat root causes and address the issue of the disproportionality of our black hispanic and minority individuals being incarcerated in the first place yes i agree it's important there's, there, but there's two, I mean, just, I want to, one more thing on it. There's two, seems to be two issues, though, that we have with our police force, right, really. Yes, there's mm -hmm. an issue of training. There's an issue of relationship. That's just part of training, right? Right. There's also white supremacy within our police force. The oh, FBI no did a study. No question. No question. And, you know, I, I think that's extremely tricky because, in a sense, how do you know? Right. You know, so often, I think what's interesting is we have so many people activated now after the Trump election, after 45 was elected. Right. And I, I still run into people that equate everything that we're fighting against with Trump. Trump created this. No, Trump was a symptom. Trump is a byproduct of systemic issues that have existed for hundreds of years. Yes. But what Trump has done is emboldened individuals to come out and be more courageous with their hate, essentially. So it's interesting to know and realize that if we truly want to, again, hold ourselves and hold our country accountable, We've had teachers, bankers, doctors, police officers, lawyers, judges, various and multiple professionals that believe in white supremacy and that have engaged in actions to maintain white supremacy and negatively impact minorities in society. If we can't be truthful about that, then we're not going anywhere. And that is true with our police forces as well. Right. So we have to create strategies in the age of social media and technology we have to invest in investigating and truly vetting who we are allowing on the force. 
in regards to the level of education, in regards to their social media accounts, in regards to their beliefs. We have to truly identify who we are allowing on our police forces. And until we do that, white supremacy is going to continue to proliferate throughout our police forces. We see white supremacy right now proliferating throughout our political system. Yes. I mean, again, look at micro and macro levels. How is that different? We have, you know, our, 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 our blue shield, blue wall of silence, blue code of silence, whatever you want to call it, when you have a bad police officer and then you have good police officers at times that remain silent. Right. How is that different between having a bad president and we have possibly good congresspersons that are remaining silent and supporting his bigotry, supporting right. his hate, supporting his fear mongering and supporting his white nationalist agenda? Yes. Macro, micro. If you understand on a micro level, you'll understand on a macro level. 